Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back to the show. I've spoken to a number of authors by this stage, and most of them have published concise and focused books that explore a singular topic in a relatively short period of time. Many of the books run to 200 or 300 pages, and they summarize their key findings beautifully. My next guest also beautifully summarizes his findings, but he takes more than 1,000 pages to do so, and his aim is not a concise exploration of a single topic, but a book that will read for generations to come because it contains three things. First of all, it is an exhaustive study of the global order. It's everything from international relations and transnational diplomacy from the 1860s to the Great Depression, and it doesn't leave much out, if anything. Second, it's a review of the major historiographical questions about global relations in this period, and therefore it's it's got useful elaborations on the interpretations of the past. Three, it's an exploration of key concepts like international law, imperialism, internationalism, etc., etc., etc. If you have students studying any of these issues, concepts, periods, or geographies, Patrick Corr's latest book, The New Atlantic Order, The Transformation of International Politics from 1860 to 1933, must be on your bibliography. In many ways, this book, which is Patrick's second, picks up from where his first, which is called The Unfinished Peace After World War I, and it was published in 2006, it picks up where that book left off. Patrick is professor of international history at the University of Florence, and before that he was an associate professor of history and international relations at Yale University. And before that he was a fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and also at the Kennedy School of Government and the Center for European Studies at Harvard University. If you've read The Unfinished Piece, which is Patrick's first book, his latest book will not come as a surprise because it's a work of serious scholarship, extensive research, and it delves deep into the transatlantic relationship through its diplomats, power dynamics, and the ideas that shaped that order. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you so much for having me, uh, Mike. And uh... Well, I think we have to talk about the, the tome that's in the room um, and then really a trivial question about the book itself. So the book is The New Atlantic Order, and it is over 1,000 pages in length. I was looking at the index, which is 40 pages, uh, which is quite impressive. And the bibliography is so extensive that you broke the, it, it into regions, you know, geography, countries. Um, I, I suppose my first question is, is you know, we hear a lot about how publishers are asking authors to scale back the number of pages and that there's a, you know, there's financial reasons for that, I guess. But how did you get your publisher to say, I've got this book that's a thousand pages long and I need you to publish it. How did you pitch it to Cambridge? Well, um, you know, there, there is a prehistory to this. Um, it's a, it's a grown evolving relationship between, uh, uh, an editor and myself. He was a young incoming editor when I did my first book, The Unfinished Piece, which is only 700 pages. But it was already quite a long book at the time. And, but we got in, you know, so we did that. And it's, it's, it had quite a, quite a lot of resonance and it sold well. And so we had a precedent. And if you are in the UK, it's always good to have a precedent. And so it's only because of that and because this editor, Michael Watson, is now the head of you know, humanities and trade publishing with Cambridge that he knew what, what would be coming. I think he still was a bit surprised how uh, uh, massive this new uh, book was. And I actually cut around 80,000 words. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's only 1,130 pages. And, but nonetheless, this is, you know, so this was all a kind of evolving project. And because he, and this I really appreciate, is interested in publishing not just big books in terms of quantity, but books that really make an intervention yeah, sort of in the big picture on how we understand the modern world. And this book is actually, well, it's, I'm, I've attempted to write it in a rather tight and yeah, kind of compelling way, not in a laborious sort of unending way, but it covers the long 20th century and it goes back to antiquity. There are many dimensions in it that require some elaboration because otherwise it would be you know, hard to follow. And one of the things I, I did, and um, I had also um, 
interesting feedback from the publisher was to write an introduction of only 40 pages, which really lays out the main kind of, you know, the context, my thesis, the kinds of claims I make, and how I view you know, the transformation of the, the world, and especially the global and Atlantic order um, between you know, the mid, what used to be called the mid 19th century, which I call the dawn of the long 20th century, and the era of the First World War. And then um, the, the book also has a, a kind of outlook, uh, both in the introduction and at the end, because it's only the, it's the second of a trilogy yeah, of books that map this evolution, sort of the transformation of the international order in the long 20th century. So the final volume I'm working on now, it's, it will be called Pax Atlantica. And it will take us to the period from 1933 to the mid 1960s and with an epilogue to today. Yeah, so to the present. Um, and this, so it's the larger project and I will also do this book with Cambridge. So there is this whole, yeah, so there's a, there's a whole project which is very unorthodox, I admit, because as you say, especially in the United States, um, most publishers would try to get you know authors to do more a 200 page book a long essay or whatever and to take out the footnotes and so on and i think there are there are themes and topics that you know that are that lend itself themselves to that uh, absolutely and maybe i should write a very short book at some point but i do think that if you have you know if you want to contest a lot of the reigning interpretations, Eric Hobsbawm or Cold War history, you have to substantiate it. Otherwise, it is just, uh, you know, you could write an essay. But if you write a book, uh, that's what you should try to do, I feel. And, um, and finally, this book is also, it's written wherever possible from original sources, on the basis of original sources. So it's not based on, you know, there's also, of course, I look at what uh, other people have written about uh, the different sort of aspects that I'm dealing with. But for the fundamental sort of um, interventions I'm trying to make and for tracing, you know, the changes of ideas, learning processes, changes in mentality that I'm trying to highlight, um, I, go, I go to original sources. And you might imagine that if you do this for the, for the United States, for Europe and in a global context, this is quite work intense and that's why there is also a long bibliography and uh, <laughs> and and that's why the book has five parts in the end well it, it's it's stunning to see the amount of archives that you visited and the collections that you, that you've looked through i think i wanted to start our conversation today in earnest with that idea of the long 20th century because it permeates this book and as you say now it also it fits in with the 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 trilogy that you you know you've conceptualized here this podcast in particular has been looking closely at the idea of periodization, um, not least because the title of the podcast is The Gilded Age and Progressive Era, which kind of fits into a, a period of sorts. But what's the value really in looking at the period as the long 20th century? Because we've seen other terms applied to this period, whether it's uh, in France, maybe the Belle Epoque, maybe a shorter time frame, perhaps, or the Victorian era from the British perspective, Gilded Age and Progressive Era in the United States. Um, what's the value of calling it the long 20th century? And I suppose a necessary question to this is what comes before the long 20th century and what comes after? Yes. So what comes after, we shall see. But so, yeah, the, the fundamental point here is that my, what I try to explain also in the, in the introduction on the very first pages um, is basically the idea, if we want to understand, yeah, what kind of impact the, the great global wars of the 20th century had, the Great War, the Second World War, and especially if we want to understand why it was so difficult, uh, why it took so long, why it was not possible in many ways to establish a new modern, yeah, stable, but also legitimate international system, an international order that yeah, uh, preserved peace that preserved a kind of a peace to end all wars, as Wilson yeah, uh, uh, called for at the time. Then we have to widen the focus, and we need to get away from yeah. So there is a lot of uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on the moment of the Paris Peace Conference, the Wilsonian moment, all these kinds of yeah. So even if we want to understand this transformative time, I argue you need to look at the bigger picture because. What you have to understand is not just yeah, the catastrophic impact of the war itself, 
yeah, all the, the empires it smashed, the kind of, you know, the brutality, the violence it brought, the changes in gender relations and so on. Yeah, so there's, you need to understand that obviously, but this has a longer prehistory. Yeah, so there is the, the era of high imperialism, there's the era of globalizing um, international competition, yeah, between Europeans, and the United States as a sort of aspiring, rising uh, world power, but also unprepared in the era of Theodore Roosevelt, sort of, and then Japan trying to be one of those powers. And then, you know, this affects the whole world, but it leads to a kind of situation that, of course, does not start in 1914, where in the end, yeah, we have to explain why did this war occur? Yeah, so why was it not possible to avoid this escalation of violence in 1914? And this takes me back to yeah, the dawn of the long 20th century, which is roughly around the 1860s. That's when yeah, the, the previous system of the long 19th century, this is what we have to get towards, the Vienna system, yeah, very Eurocentric, European dominated, collapsed. It, it, it corroded under these new pressures. So we have yeah, the formation of the German Empire, new states emerging. We have the reunification of the United States in a way after the Civil War. Yeah? So that was not a foregone conclusion, but it, it occurred and it set the stage for the rise, so-called, yeah, of the United States as a, as, a, as a global power. We have the so-called Meiji Restoration, which is really a revolution in Japan. Yeah, and we have these dynamic state building and uh, mobilization projects, yeah, which also involve, of course, this idea that you now had, if you wanted to be a first rate power a state, you had to be a world power. So you had to create naval forces, you had to mobilize your population. So these kinds of pressures, you, I, I want to sort of link and put in one context with the era of the First World War. Yeah? So it's not this compartmentalization that we have the pre-1914, 19th century that we look at, and then there is this war, and then we look at 1919, but to put it in one context. And this basically then, you know, contests, but also tries to engage with what I would consider the two reigning, yeah, kind of narratives or ideas that, that we have in the ac academic world. One is very substantial, I find, that's the long 19th century. Yeah, so Eric Hobsbawm started this with his volumes on the age of revolution, capital, and imperialism. He later then juxtaposed that to the short 20th century. He was a good coiner of phrases, so he wrote the age of extremes. But he and others like him, they are, uh, I would say, you know, from a left perspective, they, they are socialized in the era of the Cold War. And so for them, the Cold War and this competition between the rising you know, kind of Bolshevik kind of vision of the world and the liberal capitalist American dominated on the other, this is very formative. I argue that this is too narrow. <laughs> yeah, this is a concern for, uh, it's understandable. Yeah? And nowadays we have um, Arnie Westart at Yale, Who's, who's produced the most sophisticated, very interesting, you know, broad interpretation of this in his works on the global Cold War that basically go back in time to look at the origins of these kinds of, you know, to this, in the end, almost Manichaean uh, 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 competition. So we have, yeah, the short 20th century and then the long 19th century and wonderful work has been done on the long 19th century, especially here, what we have to mention is Jürgen Osterhammel's, you know, masterful, the transformation of the world. So it takes you from the era of the 18th century, you know, Atlantic revolutions, the American, the French and other sort of, and, and those processes to roughly around 1920. Yeah, so, and this, I think, um, yeah, this is set, set, set the new gold standard for global history, I would say. So there, there's a really interesting you know, sort of body of work on what, how the world was transformed. Yet, if you think about it, if you take the long 19th century, what's at its end? Yeah, so you have these competing big imperial states, and then something happens, and they do they will not last much longer in that form. Yeah, and so my argument is to understand the transformation of the international order and this idea that a modern international order is one where you have states being the leading actors not empires yeah but you of course you have imperial states like the british uh, empire in france in 1919 hanging on to the empires nonetheless if you think of the league of nations if you think of you know the un later the idea is you have these 
yeah states that are supposed to have be recognized yeah and then they are part of a new structure of new institutions that are supposed to bring conflict resolution and peace and might even sign up to the same tenets of international law and to understand how difficult it was and why it took so long yeah to gain to to advance towards a more sustainable yeah always contested modern order of states yeah in the long in the in in the modern era i find that you have to look at this wider perspective so from the time when these states first emerged as modern players around 1860 of course not on the 1st of january 1860 not on the 2nd of february but around that time towards yeah you know, the this um period which has often been described as yeah you know, the interwar period or the 30 years war of the 20th century i describe it as a kind of dialectic reordering phase yeah where in reaction to massive crises like the first world war then the great depression and the second world war some structural fundamental changes did occur yeah and so this book in the end tries to answer the question why it was not yet possible yeah to build a more durable integrative yeah legitimate international order at the paris peace conference an order that the victors and the vanquished the empires and the anti imperial nationalists could somehow see as a framework for a common future um and then of course we have to explain why it was possible under the conditions of the cold war but also yeah by generations of actors who had gone through this era of incessant crisis the 1930s yeah the the second world war but who also like monet like many others were already present yeah when uh, in paris this attempt was made to build something like a atlantic security community um you know a new kind of uh, ideas of international law and arbitration so so we have uh, many of the ideas that eventually come to fruition yeah in the 1940s 50s present and so the the following argument then would be it's not enough to explain all the changes after 1945 just by the cold war yeah so saying that it's because there's this soviet threat these things happen i i argue that yes this is important but we have to understand the longer term learning processes of people like keynes yeah or the truman uh, generation franklin roosevelt and on the european side if you think of you know bevin and uh, uh Ch you know churchill in his own way and many other activists and people who had been struggling with trying to think well why have all our ideals of a league of nations of a new peace yeah why have they not uh worked <laughs> before yeah and so these are this is the the one of the core themes of the book really you know how, how does learning really work yeah in in modern times in international politics but also in wider societal processes so this is not just a question for a few you know big statesmen to learn the lessons of history it's it's about uh, much more than that it's about yeah sort of uh, societies thinking you know so what how do we have to change our ways if we want to live in peace with our neighbors yeah and so on so that these are sort of just to give you this kind of that's that would be the outline of of the major arguments that you can read on pages sort of 1 through 10 of the introduction of this book <laughs> it's much more layered than that once you get into it i think uh, uh, and what what's really interesting to me is uh, the sort of classic historical dichotomy of uh, change and continuity here because as you say about this learning it's in some ways a reaction to events that are unfolding that are not within the sort of ability of anyone to change and then also there are those things that there's human agency in and and this makes for a really compelling story and i'm not sure entirely how that tectonic change well how you represent it i think is wonderful but it is like this string that you keep on pulling and more more string keeps on coming i mean could you go back further beyond 1860 to the 1840s and say the concert of europe is collapsing in 1848 you know the mexican american war is making the united states bigger J japan is being opened up and you know this is it's like a constant piece of string how do you handle uh pulling on that thread and then also dealing with the layers and the tectonic shifts that are going on in in the ideas and the agency of, of the people that are the diplomats and states 
Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, so the book actually, you know, there, there is a chapter one which goes uh, back beyond the 1860s. It's about the Vienna system, the reaction of Europeans, the sort of statesmen and leaders to the challenge of the French Revolution and Napoleon's idea of building a kind of empire in Europe and making that the new model. Yeah, and then it tries to show how yeah uh, they in turn were looking at uh, balance of power ideas of the 18th century and in the end i tend to go back to thucydides yeah and the peloponnesian war so there i'm trying to give the reader a sense that some of these fundamental questions yeah how to order relations between different peoples or states or cities as it used to be in greece yeah that that this has been on the agenda of thinking human beings for millennia yeah and but of course if i had had written this in a more elaborate way uh, then this book would have had at least 2000 pages so at some point you have to find a kind of you know you have to set up the frame and i'm trying to do that in the first chapter and then i i, I argue so there there are as you said there are very important processes happening around the 1840s so we have the crimean war where already you know you have the former members of the concert fighting one another especially russia on the one hand and britain and france on the other we have the first inkling of this need to be global a global player yeah so the the question of the black sea uh, the ottoman empire and so on we have britain becoming you know a second uh, empire after the atlantic yeah sort of the loss of the american uh, colonies and being way ahead uh, in this way um, and we have of course the idea that you know you have the, the revolutionaries in germany in particular in the pulse church saying we can actually build a greater republican germany yeah in the revolution of 1848 so this german question what will happen in this at the center of europe of course is high on the agenda but as you uh, i'm sure you know so it's exactly these liberals these professors yeah uh, who fail in the task of actually thinking uh, harder about whether boundaries of germany were supposed to be if you look at some of the the ideas they had where germany was supposed to stop yeah, this takes us to greater German imperial fantasies of the First World War and, and eventually to a certain Austrian leader that, uh, yeah, so Hitler, who then took this to another extreme. So there is a lot of learning from these examples as well. Yeah, so uh, eventually it is Bismarck who, in his own way, um, yeah, conducts a revolution from above and uh, keeps Austria out and, 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 and builds the empire on this very strange and, and bad foundation of a victory over France and a ceremony in Versailles that yeah, humiliates um, the French uh, uh, nation. And this, the verb reverberations of that, you can feel in 1919 when Clemenceau, who is not a reactionary politician, he's a very liberal, very, you know, well-versed um, uh, uh, liberal Democrat, but nonetheless feels the need to yeah, get back at the German delegation. So when there is the ceremony, when they hand the terms, not for negotiation, but just for uh, acceptance by the Germans, it's it's a ceremony that's uh, that's a sort of a reaction to 18, 1870, 1871. And so one of the ways in which I try to look at so these these or to incorporate these dimensions is both structurally to yeah, sort of start with the wider framework in a concise way and then to show how the different actors actually how how far this matter to them yeah so where do they take their bearings where do they think so are there useful precedents in britain for example you have a lot of people like cecil um, or even lloyd george eventually who look back to castle rays um, ideas of the european concert and who argue well now we have to construct a kind of atlantic concert because the americans have to be <laughs> involved yeah so we have to find a way to call the league of nations uh, sort of the the, the vessel um, that that can contain uh, an atlantic concert and clearly they th they are thinking about um 1814 1815 there's also a, a, a rather famous book by Webster on this, yeah, that they read. Um, so in this way, you know, they 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 take their bearings there. Whereas someone like Woodrow Wilson says explicitly that the peacemakers of uh, Paris have nothing to learn from previous precedents because these were just you know reactionary forces that were imposing their will on the world and they were corrupt. So he shows his entire 
provincialism at this point because he takes his cues from US domestic history, yeah, his own writings on basically US self-government. And he is reading some, especially um, English liberal pamphlets that, you know, around 1914 come up with this not new idea, but again, they bring it back to, to life of wouldn't it, sort of a League of Nations. Yeah, so there's especially this Cambridge classicist um, um, uh, Goldsworthy, who uh, who wrote, you know, who, who wrote a piece that then I think the New Republic republished and the nation. And so it, it got into the American sort of realm. And then Wilson seized on it. And then in a, in a way that, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt would later handle this in the New Deal, he said, this is a very um, important American idea <laughs> so, <laughs> for the world. And he had the power to make a lot of people believe that yeah, it was now the American idea of the League of Nations, whereas those Europeans who had any idea, any, any knowledge of international relations knew that that, that was a very um, far-fetched claim. Yeah? Yet nonetheless, he becomes the most important, most powerful spokesman of, um, of the League. And yet he, you know, so he, 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 his way of learning from history is completely different. It's basically saying, we basically have to do everything in exactly a different way from the way the Europeans used to do things, because what they did led us into this war. Yeah, and and very interestingly, I find so the origin originally Wilson is very interested in having yeah, a so-called peace without victory. So he is especially interested in not in avoiding a humiliation of yeah, one side or another. He thinks, like many liberals, that the very scale, the very you know catastrophe of this war should show everyone that these kinds of wars are completely pointless. Yeah? So that should be the basis for building a new peace. And this, of course, would have involved, um, had he succeeded, a German empire, yeah? not a German republic, a German empire that, and a Russian empire that would have had to sign up to a League of Nations. And so what, what comes sort of to the fore here is Wilson's experience as a southerner in the United States, because yeah, so one of the things he felt was very, very problematic was the imposition of terms by the North when they won the American Civil War and the humiliation this caused in the South. Yeah, so this is this is his uh, kind of precedent that he looks at, and it's clearly taken from American history, not from international yeah, history. And that's why I think it's important to be precise, you know, to study ideas of certain actors um, and to compare, because very often we have to understand how differently they thought about the world, the challenges that they faced. Yeah? And, and then, yeah, I guess, so you have to then explain how difficult it was for them to find common ground yeah? in 1919, uh, when they use sometimes the same words, but they mean completely different things. Yeah? And so, um, that, that's also something in the third part of the book, I'm trying to give some space to, to these kinds of, you know, readjustment processes that are, that are necessary everywhere ar across the world, in the United States, in Europe, uh, having to deal with the United States, and in all the kind of, you know, the colonized, so-called colonized world, also in China, yeah, which at that point is semi-dependent, it's, it's, you know, it's basically um, a subject of um, of European and American imperialism, yeah, in the, in the so-called open door uh, phase, um, and you have a new Chinese Republic, and you have people who were partly trained at places like Yale, yeah, and they spoke the language of this new American progressivisms, and so they, like Wellington Koo said, yes, now we want real self-government and self-determination. Isn't that what, <laughs> yeah, the United States, uh, yeah, should promote? And, and then it's interesting to describe how Wilson has to maneuver because he hadn't thought about all this before. <laughs> yeah, so the implications of his rhetoric come, come back to haunt him in many ways because he has some you know, senators and, 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 and opposition figures in Washington who don't want uh, to yeah, sort of change the regime in China, which is so lucrative and where they can do what they want uh, in many ways. And they don't want a new kind of freedom of, you know, circulation and of Chinese coming to the United States and so on. So they have, you know, there are there are there are so many kind of hypocrisies, double standards, yeah, you know, that on all sides that we also have to understand if we want to understand why this great, you know, rhetoric of the new world order in reality was a much more hierarchical and 
yeah, sort of uh, oh, sort of pre uh, 1914 model. Yeah, it was a new. It, it had many neo imperial um, segments, and at the at the core of which is this question: Who thinks they have the power, not just the power, but also the authority to determine the rules of the new order? Yeah, and here, if you look at Wilson or Lloyd George. You have clearly uh, this this hierarchical, you know, pre nineteen fourteen assumption that it's the the Anglo American, the Anglo Saxon races, the Protestants, yeah, the the ones that have shown that they they they're capable of winning this war, but that they also they are the most civilized, they're the most advanced, yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, sort of um, segments of humanity. Um, and and Wilson ha has these very interesting speeches where he distinguishes between that and French claims to leadership that he <laughs> situates at a lower level. And then this, you know, this, this interesting question, how do you deal with the representatives of Germany? Now the Republican Germany, Weimar, yeah, they are Protestant, they are very, yeah, they're social democrat and liberal, but somehow he, politically it's impossible to treat them as equals. So he famously, you know, when he realized that he would not be able to just impose his will, on Paris, he had to think of a new rationale. Yeah? And he used very moralistic and very kind of hierarchical uh, conceptions saying, so now as before he had said, the First World War was the result of systemic problems, all the Europeans, yeah, they were engaged in imperialism and, and so on. And, and this, had to, this had to blow up at some point. Now, it is the military masters of Germany that are responsible and those who have not oppose them in Germany. Yeah? So they now have to undergo a period of probation. Yeah? They have to show that they are really committed to be good Democrats. But they also have to show, and this is quite, I think, very important, that they simply will fulfill the terms that will not be negotiated with them, but will be imposed on them. If they do that, then they can enter the league, then they can become part of the new order. And from a German liberal and social democratic point of view, if you think of figures like Scheidemann or Friedrich Ebert, the, who think that they are, of course, very uh, yeah, sort of convinced Democrats and have much more to say about democracy than Wilson, yeah, they feel relegated to this role of a pariah. Yeah? And, and this, if you think about the consequences this had for the stabilization of the Weimar Republic, but especially for those who did not want a compromise with the Western powers. Yeah? So the militarists, the autocrats that didn't want a republic in Germany in the first place, and the young generation of, you know, like a, a young corporal Hitler, yeah? who thinks that this kind of American thinking is yeah, hypocritical and it's arrogant and it, sh it should not be accepted. Yeah? So for these kinds of segments, this behavior by Wilson and others um, leads to the conclusion that they will they cannot expect a fair peace, and so they have to prepare to next time win uh, a new war. Yeah, and and this is the battle within Germany. So uh, again, um, this has a lot to do with also very exaggerated hopes that these some Germans had of a Wilsonian peace that somehow yeah um, would make a defeat turn a defeat into a. Uh, into a wonderful opportunity to uh, rejoin the, the League of Nations. So there was a lot of yeah, illusion and, uh, and yeah, um, propaganda also involved on the German side. But what the book tries to analyze is the kinds of consequences, yeah, Wilson's rhetoric and the rhetoric also of the Lloyd George government had. Yeah? Um, and the, 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 the basic challenge yeah, to try to work out compromises, solutions to all these different problems, how to deal with the vanquished, how to integrate yeah, the Ger new German Republic, Austria, Hungary, the Bolshevik question, yeah, what will happen with Russia, a question we, we, we are facing again we've now. Not even, yeah, we've not even touched on that yet. And yeah, so that's another one. Yeah, so, so just to say, this, this one, many historians have said it's just the overwhelming complexity of all these problems. I do think this is a one important dimension, but Nonetheless, we should also try to understand how far were these actors equipped and their ideas and mental sort of outlooks germane towards actually dealing with them. Yeah, and uh, 
And this, so I think it's, I find it not so convincing either just to say, oh, whatever was done at Paris, it was just the best possible under the circumstances. It was so difficult, so they at least got something done. This is still very prevalent if you think of Margaret Macmillan's uh, very influential book on, on, on Paris and many others. So uh, Zara Steiner's great work on the lights that failed. It's sort of, that's the premise. My premise is more to say, look, we need to understand the limitations of this piece. Yeah, and we also need to understand um, that it's illusory to think that after a war of the magnitude of the First World War, and in light of the prehistory yeah, that I mentioned, the dawn of yeah, all these very conflict-ridden, yeah, destabilizing processes, this global competition, sort of, you know, come what may, unlimited, um, before 1914, um, it's very illusory to think that at one peace conference you can settle this new order yeah so you 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 put it in writing and there is the covenant of the league and then it's supposed to work somehow yeah so my book is trying to describe reordering and peacemaking as a much more long term process yeah so that for example takes from 19, late 1918 after the armistice through the 1920s, yeah, eventually in the in the fifth in the epilogue of the book, I refer to some more far-reaching actual peace settlements, yeah, that were achieved not in 1919 but later after the Ruhr crisis of 1923, when you know that you had first actual negotiated compromises with Weimar Germany on reparations and eventually on the very pivotal security question, yeah, because I think it's probably quite understood, but but maybe worth pointing out that, of course, after this catastrophic, you know, war that had led to millions of death and devastation of northern France and Belgium, yeah, so the what was foremost in many politicians and, and voters' minds was how could one avoid a recurrence of this catastrophic war? How could one have a new kind of security? And here we see you know how really very fundamentally different approaches clash you have yeah the french thinking not uh, in old fashioned terms but in a very innovative way um you have tardieu and some other um, advisors of clemenceau basically conceptualizing what later would become the north atlantic alliance they call it an atlantic security community yeah and they think that you need to have a firm alliance, especially between France, Britain, and the United States. But yeah, for them, of course, the main purpose of this was to not to contain Russia, yeah, because they they even wanted Russia to somehow still become uh, Tsarist again or yeah or, or non-Bolshevik and and to help with the actual task, and that of course was to contain Germany. Yeah, so their idea of NATO was that it should police. A civilizational frontier yeah and today we're talking about the Dnieper or Ukraine back then as as you might guess the this frontier was on the Rhine yeah it was the Rhine frontier <laughs> yeah so and they were trying to convince Wilson that the League of Nations was not enough for this yeah that you needed a more a sort of a more robust uh, system Patrick can I ask you about that because it wasn't just the security uh, that that the French were looking for, or actually even some Americans like the Republicans in Congress and Theodore Roosevelt, you know, the opponents of Wilson. But it was the idea that Wilson's moral suasion was not a powerful enough device to keep any country. And we see, we see this in the 30s, uh, you know, where your book ends, is that that idea of the League of Nations, you know, the equality that's built into it and the moral suasion, which is really the force behind the collective security, yeah, yeah. Simply not enough. So are the arguments of the late 19th and early 20th century against the League, are, are they well founded in, in terms of realpolitik? Yeah, interesting question. And I basically uh, would think it's a bit it's different. It's it's a bit more complicated than that because it is to begin with not your but a general misconception that Wilson only thought of yeah, moral suasion and public opinion to, con to to contain aggressors. He actually thought at a very late stage and not enough, but he did think of sanctions and security guarantees. I mean, there was, after all, a security guarantee agreement uh, negotiated between Britain, the United States, and France as a kind of complement. 
Yeah. So, but Wilson uh, clearly did think that rather than accentuated military deterrence yeah, and keeping a power contained and isolated, um, in the long run, you needed to integrate them in a secure way from a position of strength. Yeah. So they would not be able to overturn the, the, the order, but um, that, that you had to involve them in what he called the clearing house. Yeah. So it's like an, he also used this phrase and in the league should be an international concert. Of course, he thought it would be a concert where he would be the conductor. Yeah. And eventually he would just, you know, preside and mediate all these uh, solutions. But nonetheless, yeah, so he he did think of, for example, a League Council. Yeah, that is the model clearly for the later UN Security Council. Many scholars have always sort of contrasted the League as having no real structure and then the, the, the United Nations. Yeah, so and this is a mis this is quite misleading because not least due to British and French pressure, yeah, the, it was very clear that the victorious powers wanted to um, uh, accord themselves very elevated yeah, veto uh, uh, power because they argued that in the end, they had to do the work of keeping global peace in accordance with their imperial interests and so on. Yeah, but nonetheless, so Wilson had also a, a more, let's say, not very thought through, but clearly also more hard fisted idea of collective security. It was just more integrative. Yeah? So he wanted to integrate eventually all the states and then sort of yeah, rein them in that way. And funnily enough, this is also what Clemenceau wanted in the longer run. Yeah? So he said, eventually we have to find a compromise with Germany, but first we have to be assured yeah, by American guarantees, by British guarantees, that if the Germans don't play by these rules, then the, uh, the allies or the half allies would come to France's aid. So in that sense, um, yes, figures like Theodore Roosevelt or Henry, Harry, Henry Cabot Lodge, the, the opponents of Wilson in the political sphere, they actually were much more in favor of a more kind of, you know, targeted alliance, uh, like a, an Atlantic alliance. But as you, uh, as you will appreciate, um, they could not say this very openly because you still were in an era in American politics where having specific alliances in peacetime was anathema to the big doctrines of not doing this. Yeah, so this is still something Franklin Roosevelt would grapple with, and even Truman, yeah, after the Second World War, when they finally did enter into such an alliance. Nonetheless, I would say, yeah, the, the security question. There's a big chapter in the book on this because. We, we, we are in a period which I think is especially resonate, resonating now, uh, yeah, where, where you think, uh, yeah, so there is such a need for, yeah, how do you ensure international, domestic, uh, and sort of on the ground security, yeah, sort of how do you in, in sh contain violence, uh, revisionism, all these questions. How do you protect minorities? How do you ensure the security of the Jewish minorities in Eastern Europe? Yeah, so the, there's a gigantic kind of modern, much more sort of grander security question um, uh, uh, arising out of a war that had shown that yeah, you could go back to absolute barbarism with gas, with mass slaughter in the West and with you know, an ongoing war in Eastern Europe. Well, this is what makes your book so important, I think, is that it, it, it resonates today, those questions about how we, we as, and, I, and I mean we as all, all being agents of uh, diplomacy and, and international relations, how we uh, conceive of the world and the order, the ideas that we have, have real implications for how it actually plays out. Yes. And, and so my favorite part about your book is your ability to weave together the agents, the people. I mean, you've rattled off, you must have rattled off nearly 50 names so far in this conversation. And, and as well, the institutions and the ideas. And that's, that's an integration that some books fail to do just because they see institutions as more important than human agency. But it's also something that's incredibly difficult to do in 200, 300 pages anyway, which is an explanation perhaps for why your book is so long. Let me ask you about that, because one of the things that does come out in your book in several of the chapters is that this is the period when globalization really, you know, as we know it today, begins in earnest. And how does that idea from the agents and from the institutions play out? And I don't just mean the League of Nations. I'm talking about peace activists that you write about and international congresses. Tell us a little bit about that, because uh, your book does a no, wonderful no. job. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's again, that's one of the, the, the showcases uh, for saying we need to think of the long 20th century because a lot of these trends, yeah, both the globalization of capitalism and, uh, and exports and imperialist competition, this starts, of course, especially in the what I call the dawn of the long 20th century or what we might call the mid 19th century. Yeah, and this is a period when you have this immense dynamism, yeah, in which cer certain states accord themselves the, the right to just, you know, sort of divide up the rest of Africa, to divide up China and so on, and to say we every every sort of every part of the world is part of this new competition. And there are some, yeah, this is civilizational Darwinism, who will come out on top. So you have to struggle, you have to show, yeah, that you are at the top. And this is uh, so this goes on in the through the um, sort of decades before 1914, and there is no limit to this. And this is something again that I think puts it into context with our period. If you think of yeah, 2008, the financial crisis. So where's the limit to the kind of speculation and competition? Yeah, that is sort of it's an it's a never-ending process. And then the question arises: Can and should it be regulated somehow? Yeah, and this is a big question that arises already before. 1914 uh, in in peace uh, sort of terms this is the period when in the united states and uh, in europe and also in japan and other parts of the world the idea uh, uh, sort of arises that you need to have a much stronger regime of international law yeah so the reign of international law and this eventually finds expression in the hague conventions yeah so in the hague conventions and in these very important networks of international lawyers, politicians, peace activists that think that the future, yeah, that there can only be a future for humanity if you have this new code of conduct. Yet, as other people have shown, but I also try to show in a more comprehensive way, many of these actors also had deeply hierarchical yeah, ideas. Who set these rules and laws? Uh, and it's not surprising. Uh, usually Protestants from the United States, uh, Britain and Germany and a few French like Leon Bourgeois, yeah, a, a big uh, protagonist here. And they did involve some of the other yeah, representatives from other parts of the world, but in a very well, kind of subservient role. And they also, and this is important, they, they try to legalize and to rationalize imperialist conquest and imperialist sort of control mechanisms. Again, this idea that yeah, yes, you have to lead everyone in the world towards self-government and towards being yeah, on, this, uh, on an equal par, but they are not yet ready. They are not yet advanced enough. And so this is, these kinds of ideas come back, yeah? they, or they, they are present throughout the First World War, and eventually they will lead to you know, sort of British and smart South African and other ideas for the uh, the so-called mandate system yeah so where you have a league of nations being the framework um, in which uh, the most advanced but also just the most powerful imperial states surprisingly enough divide up mandates according to exactly their geostrategic interests so you know famously france you know uh, taking it upon itself to uh, rule over syria and lebanon very selflessly so, and even more selflessly, the British, yeah, they take Iraq, uh, where oil, um, you know, uh, should not be left to the devices of the locals, yeah, they have to be carefully trained, and this, of course, uh, is based on, you know, if you read John Darwin's work, it's based on techniques of rule uh, that the British world system and those who were running it have, yeah, have perfected, especially in India, uh, long before the the first world war yeah and, of and course, you have the, middle the, east states are, yeah. the middle east peoples are uh, are are top of the mandate system the yeah. british french and the, the americans they they have a pecking order right exactly there's again a high they're always hierarchy so the book had uh, de deals a lot with the kind of you know the double standards between universalist egalitarian rhetoric yeah especially in anglo-american rhetoric but also french and there's a german version of this and so on and the reality of building new hierarchies where you justify your yeah your neo imperial pursuits with a language that is more adapted to yeah the the kinds of um, sensitivities that's not least some of the peace activists bring to the table yeah who don't want this to go on um, but nonetheless um, yeah so just to say 
all these actors, so state leaders, um, transnational activists, transnational associations, the Women's Peace Party, the League of Nations Union, all these kinds of people, they were already doing a lot of what they were, would be doing under the globalization terms before 1914. Then the war occurs, and of course it smashes up globalization for a while because you have you know, the British blockade, you have all kinds of boundaries, and you have ideas arising in Germany, for example, that one has to be more autarkic in the future. Yeah? You cannot be so dependent on your potential competitors. This eventually will lead to Hitler's yeah? sort of excessive ideas of having to have a Eurasian empire where yeah, he, could, uh, he, could, he could have all the kinds of resources that, that this greater German empire would need. Well, it'll lead to American closed doors around the world as well during uh, yeah. Franklin Roosevelt's time mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah. even before that. Um, I, I had a question for you. We had Andrew Priest. I don't know if you know Andrew. He's a historian, uh, Americanist, but also has mm -hmm. written a wonderful book called Designs on Empire, which yeah. came out this year with Cornell. Mm -hmm. And it's really about how the United States learned about mm -hmm. imperialism from, from European powers and also yes. differentiated its yeah. own ideas based on yeah. Ottoman, European, and Japanese mm. empires. Yeah, how that's a very you, good book, yes. It's a wonderful book, yeah. How do, you, how do you see American imperium? I mean, is it exceptional? Is it learned? Or as I expect you'll say, it, it's something in between. It is both, yeah. I have a long uh, third chapter on which I call the ascent in, in quotation marks, yeah? the ascent of an exceptional world power question mark, I believe. Yeah, because I do think that uh, this again, uh, you, we're dealing a lot with self-perception and double standards. Yeah, so the the United States is the most consciously anti-imperialist imperial power. Yeah, in the modern era, um, if you think about how it expanded the empire of liberty in North America, in a most brutal way. Yeah, but with you know, if you think of the Indian Removal Act, it has a whole kind of clinical language of how it's best for the natives to be you know, sent into the desert so they would not be contaminated by uh, contact and so on. So it has this legal language that, you know, sort of that suggests that something very humane is being done, whereas something very shockingly uh, you know, uh, one-sided is being done. Yeah, so, and this is a kind of, it's a colonialism of, of a US kind then relations between the United States and Mexico and its other neighbors the absolute refusal to treat anyone as an equal. Yeah, so to have, uh, this is exceptionalism. Then um, the book also shows how, yeah, it's not new, but I think it's, it, it belongs into this wider context, how the United States, you know, when you think of Seward in the age of Lincoln, yeah, so the Pacific frontier, the new frontier, once the, the continental frontier is closed, we have the Pacific frontier. And this means that the United States, of course, has to have a leading role and penetrate China and force Japan to open up, which means to accept American terms. How do they do it? With gunboats. That is not very original. Yeah? In China, if you think of you know, the, the, the British uh, uh, go ahead and the, the Americans learn a lot from the British. I mean, you can see that from John, T John Quincy Adams onwards, you have rhetoric against this evil British empire, but in practice, yeah, they take what they need from the, the British, yeah? so how to deal with naval supremacy, how to deal with yeah? uh, suggesting that they are doing it for the best of ma humankind. So uh, famously after the Opium Wars, it's the, the British go ahead with the uh, Nanjing Treaty imposing on China their terms. But the Americans only a few years later um, have the, I can't pronounce it, it's, I think the Wangir Treaty, yeah? which is exactly the same, but it has even more uh, sort of strictures and impositions because the Americans also want missionaries to have free reign in China. Yeah? So in that sense, the Americans are an informal, half formal imperial power in the Pacific long before we get towards McKinley. Yeah? And this is something that yeah, is there is some awareness that this might be dangerous for the republic and for the spirit, but and you have you know eventually uh, something like the anti-imperialist league formed in Boston and so on, but you have a lot of um, uh, I would say U.S. actors who get a lot of mileage out of always saying that how different they are from these Europeans, Europeans who do the bad kind of imperialism and the Americans do develop. I mean nowadays they would call it development or. Yeah, and, and, and Seward has this whole theory of how 
the expansion of commerce along Amer US American lines will bring peace and civilization. Yeah, well, this, and this, of course, if you compare that with the, um, the rationales of British liberal imperialism, they are almost identical. Yeah, so so it's it's a it's a kind of it's a it's a it's a device. So in that sense, yeah, uh, we could talk about Theodore Roosevelt in this respect and many others. Uh, they they have I, I find you know it's an it's an imperialist mindset. The imperial republic comes to mind. Yeah, think of think of the corollary to the to the Monroe Doctrine. Yeah, where uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh, expost expostulates that yeah. It is it is for the U.S. American Senate or you know, Congress to decide if there is ill-begotten conduct in Central America. Why should there be such conduct? Yeah, at a time when it's American companies, it's American money that corrupts that yeah sort of that causes all the problems. But it is then yeah um, uh, well they find reasons to justify unilateral interventions. Well, I think your your point is is well taken. Especially, you could look at the Monroe Doctrine, not just the Roosevelt Corollary, being co-written by George Canning, or you could even look at the Open Door Notes, which really was inspired by the British writer Charles Beresford. Or Beresford. Uh, so yeah, there's that. There's those influences, and there's people in Congress that are standing up during the annexation of the Philippines, saying, "Well, we're like any European nation; we can take what we want." I, I think that that's a really great part of the book too. Is that it's 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 a synth, it's a synthesis synthesis in the best uh, way that that term can be said. I wondered also if we could talk a little bit about the Bolsheviks because that's something that we've not yet spent any time on. And those communist ideologies and they have a certain power in the world at this time. What influence do they have on this new Atlantic order? Yeah. Um... A major, but not the kind of massive influence that many Cold War historians have assumed. That would be my short answer. Uh, first, I would say you know, this is a, another um, uh, important theme that calls for the long 20th century, because in my interpretation, yeah, Bolshe socialism, Bolshevism, communism, yeah, they are also responses to the kind of dynamic changes that occur from the mid 19th century, the industrial revolution, the changes, the global imperialist competition. Yeah, so I, I said earlier, so this called for different ways of thinking, how can this be regulated? How can this, for example, be made to work for the gr uh, growing working classes that seem to do all the work with uh, intolerable conditions? To uh, benefit the few capitalists in the Gilded Age or in Britain, in you know, in the the Manchester <coughs> capitalism period, and and then as you know, we have different um, uh, responses. We have the more moderate, evolutionary, social democratic kind that says we need to work towards democratizing, working through parliaments, uh, not do a world revolution, but to you know sort of have an evolution towards more regulated, social democratic kind of uh, 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 reins and regulations on this excessive uh, yeah, capitalist um, uh, competition. Uh, but you have, of course, the communist uh, 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 response from the communist manifesto onwards, which at the time didn't have such a big yeah, kind of impact. But eventually, you have the, yeah, the, uh, the Bolsheviks, but also the uh, people like Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, yeah, all those who, who analyze the development of capitalism and see eventually the first world war as the natural consequence of this yeah, capitalist uh, competition and who then say and that lenin is the most forceful i'm sure is sort of agitator here saying that you know this is exactly the chance when we need to turn this war that sets workers against workers into a new kind of revolutionary war where all the workers unite and kick out the capitalist that yeah that 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 let the workers bleed so this is his mission obviously then yeah the second international the third international and eventually the common turn they they're supposed to to carry this forward and i have one chapter where i'm trying to show that it's misleading to think yeah like arno Meyer, i find uh, sort of that this is now the age it's lenin against wilson yeah because this is a cold war construction it's a stalin and roosevelt uh, look backwards you have you know a very powerful american president who's the leader of a big power and you have lenin who's trying to establish uh, with a band of revolutionaries 
first of all, that they will survive uh, in the civil war. They have a lot of ideological traction, but they are, yeah, they, they are very different actors. And I think one has to understand this. But um, there is a chapter where, you know, if you think about it, for Wilson, I would say, the influence of Bolshevism has been overstated because it fits into the Cold War analogy. For Wilson, it's much more important to get rid of Wilhelm, Wilhelmine authoritarianism yeah, and to, to work with the Germans and others and to impose his kind of self-government agenda. Yeah? He eventually has to deal with Lenin, yes? I mean, for example, he, he only uses, begins to use the word self-determination in response to Lenin. Yeah, because before that, he used to talk in an American kind of language, US American language of self-government. Yeah, this is the term that he uses. And it has something to do with Protestant self-government as we've seen it in, yeah, if you look at Tocqueville's uh, uh, description. Um, but he does not frame his entire agenda against Lenin. That would be very misleading. Yeah, this is again, this is thinking of the post 45 era, which I think has to be corrected because we have to understand what was really going on. Yeah, for Lenin, I find it very interesting to see how does he look onto Wilson and the United States. And, um, and as, I, as I analyze in, the, in this one chapter, I think it's chapter 19, um, you, uh, you get yeah, sort of Lenin, uh, at some point he writes this letter to the European and American workers because he basically understands that his main opponent, yeah, the main problem that he, he has when he, if he wants to foment a world revolution is a too charismatic liberal president who suggests that yeah, the answer to the problems of the war is not Bolshevik revolution, but an American kind of revolution, a progressive revolution. Yeah? And so he, he, of course, then tries to portray Wilson as, in the end, the, uh, yeah, just uh, the, the kind of marionette, the, the puppet of capitalism, because it has to be so, right? I mean, whereas this is, a, of course, a complete misunderstanding, yeah, uh, a willful misunderstanding of Wilson. Yeah? But, but it shows you that as I would argue, for Lenin too, there is now a transatlantic force field. Yeah. So on the one hand, yeah. So so the 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 Bolsheviks, Russia, they belong into this Atlantic reordering. Yeah. It's not just a European, or it's not yet so global. Yes, they will have yeah an impact on Ho Chi Minh and many others who come to Paris and are frustrated and eventually will go for more communist alternatives. The Chinese. Uh, African uh, representatives and so on, Latin Americans. Um, but uh, one of the core arguments of this book is that a lot of that uh, of the kinds of things that were called world or global at that time were really more Euro-Atlantic. Yeah. So because the, the rest was seen as still quite peripheral. Yeah. In in these hierarchical terms, and so for Wilson, yeah, in the end he has this idea that yeah. You should, you should, uh, the Russian people should decide finally, yeah, who they want as their ruler. But of course, he thought that, yeah, uh, if they, if they, if they are properly educated, they would uh, eventually do what the Ukrainians are doing right now. They would go for a more Western option. Yeah. So this is so he call, he con, he calls Lenin a usurper, yeah, uh, someone who tries to impose his revolutionary will on a people that. If they could be yeah, a bit more American educated for a while, would be would would opt for something else. So there is this dimension um, also in 1919 of this systemic competition. Yeah, but it is not so nicely black and white. It is not you know Wilson to think of Wilson as especially a kind of henchman of American capitalism is really you know he does of course want the open door to be globalized. He's you know that's that's a very common. Uh, sort of yeah just basic idea that all that his his secretary of of the of commerce has as well but uh, it's striking how little financial and economic considerations enter into wilson's planning yeah so that's what the europeans find so puzzling because they are indebted to the united states they want maybe some more capital from the united states but wilson doesn't deal with all these dimensions he wants to focus on the political on the League of Nations, on yeah, on moral uh, renewal. Well, on, on that, on on Wilson's fourteen points, do you think uh, 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 that they somehow, I suppose, unfairly raise expectations for the new global order? 
I mean, did it inspire to do too much in a world that was diverse and disconnected, or at least more disconnected than we often think of the early 20th century? That's certainly true, but also, you know, you have to, again, this comes back to this learning, yeah? So Wilson was utterly unprepared, and the United States as a, as a leading power was very unprepared for, for, for dealing with global responsibilities. So what happens? Uh, Wilson writes a lot of speeches himself, yeah? So he thinks out some things, and he, the 14 points is only one of uh, several important speeches that are very good on the great kind of, you know, uh, concepts or at least rhetorical figures of speech, but very thin when it comes to the implementation, how this was actually supposed to work. Then he sets up this inquiry group, yeah, which compared with, yeah, compared the delegations of Britain and France in 1919 to the American. Yeah? The, the, they, the British and the French have hundreds of experts yeah, from, you know, the, the profound corridors of uh, imperial policy making over decades, dealing with you know, the, the Indian problems, the Afghan frontier, and what, uh, whatever you want. Compared to that, the American little band of experts is a completely kind of improvised, yeah, sort of interesting uh, little group that, you know, there, there are some eminent geographers who, but who've never had been policy advisors. So on many of these issues, Wilson himself only makes more concrete kind of sort of jots down more concrete ideas on the eve of the Paris Peace Conference. Yeah? So on what uh, would a mandate system actually be, how is collective security supposed to work, and so on. And his advisors um, do this more slightly earlier, but some of them are very frustrated because Wilson doesn't listen to them. Walter Lippmann is the most famous case. He's a very important advisor early on in 1917. He coins this uh, idea of an Atlantic community yeah, for the first time in his, in his writings, but he uh, is not even in Paris anymore because he, uh, he thinks that Wilson is, you know, st is too detached and is not, is or has, has already abandoned the kinds of ideals that he wanted uh, to see realized in Paris. Yeah? So the, the bigger picture here is that there is not a kind of machinery. Uh, yeah, there's, there's not a kind of understanding. There's not a kind of preparation on the US side to take on this gigantic task of not just being one now of the leading powers, but it, supposedly the, yeah, the, the new lawmaker for the world. Yeah? And, and that has many, many consequences. And, and the 14 points, just uh, briefly, uh, what's striking about them for me yeah, is not so much the, how grandiose they are, but how thin. Yeah, so there's one sentence, a League of Nations should be founded. And there is one sentence on the, on the colonial question, which is basically a compromise. Yeah, it's something along the lines of a compromise should be found between the holders of the colonial titles and their interests and the interests and aspirations of the, 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 the natives. Well, that's a wonderful conception, but, but it basically says that imperial consideration should be given equal weight to considerations of self-government yeah and uh, and and guess how who was more powerful in uh, representing their interests in 1919 the natives or the global empires well i leave that question <laughs> to the listeners yeah we, so, all, we all know the answer to that absolutely yes, yes. i mean I, I guess the question that i really wanted to sort of get to with that is uh, without playing the blame game, Wilson mm. uh, doesn't invite people to the conference that, you know, would have been able to help with those things. People that, you know, had helped author the open mm. door notes or people that yeah. had negotiated with world powers. And at the peace conference, the, the other nations that are represented there by delegates do not necessarily embody the full spectrum of ideas from those oh. countries no, either. No. So, yes. Yes. I mean, I, mean, I, I yeah. suppose, how different are the ideas of the allies and what effect does that have on the peace? And if we play around with the notion of ideas being um, at odds, even between sort of national players like a Wilson and a Roosevelt type mm -hmm. character or, or Europeans that disagreed with this, whether it was social Democrats and communists mm -hmm. or no. what, how do we see a, a different picture emerging from Versailles and the, the world order looking different? 
Yeah, it's very, I mean, it's a very interesting and good question because the, the first thing to say here is, yes, it's absolutely vital to get away from blame game history, yeah? especially the Peace of Versailles. You have either they are to be blamed for Hitler or they, they, they are the Germans are to be blamed for not accepting an imposed peace or yeah, it's it's always this this sort of national, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a kind of national game. But this is more the older generation of historians, I think, who, who think like that. Nowadays, the problem is that most younger historians, if I may say, they are no longer interested in big questions of power. Yeah? So they, they will tell you that there were so many forward-looking, wonderful activists who said this and that, but they don't understand the world in which, or at least they don't write about the world in which these activists had to try to gain some yeah, traction for their ideas. So they had to understand the power. Yeah? And my book, not least, tries to put all this into one framework yeah, to show that uh, Part of what happened in 1919 is this super abundance of actors who want to shape the peace. And, and, and partly because of this kind of multiplicity, in the end, it becomes even more hierarchical than other peace conferences, because you, yeah, you have very few political leaders, especially the big so-called big three with their advisors, in the end, deciding most of the major questions, not even with their, yeah, their, their delegations and their, their foreign ministers, because it becomes so problematic. So this now leads us to the point that you, you were asking about. And I would basically say, look, it's absolutely, it's the common thing. It's natural that mostly we have, actors have very divergent ideas. It's very rare that you have in a major political uh, sort of spectrum, uh, an alignment, a, a consensus. This is what international politics is about. You have to deal with very clashing conceptions of interests of ideas of justice of what is, should be recognized yeah and you have to show and this can be shown in 1919 that no one has the authority or the power yeah to say we might have all these different ideas but mine are the ones that will prevail yeah wilson had this idea originally that he could you know, generate this transnational coalition of the most forward looking people and put so much pressure on everyone else like lloyd george or clemenceau that they just had to follow and follow uh, him along, yeah. And this, of course, uh, showed his provincialism. I mean, that showed his absolute inexperience. And very soon, he did realize, however, and this is also important, this is not the end of the story, yeah. So he had to regear himself, and he engages in months of very tight, hard-fisted bargaining, yeah, uh, about what kind of guarantees for France, what would happen between Poland and Germany and so on. Yeah? So he learned on the job, but under very, in very tense circumstances to do modern negotiation uh, process. Yeah? And, and this, uh, the book tries to show, um, we all, again have to put in a wider context because what is happening here, I call it yeah, the first uh, massive attempt to, to make a modern peace under more or less democratic circumstances. Yeah? Of course, these three main powers, they are very imperfect democracies. Yeah? The United States, there will be an amendment that will give women the right to vote, but that's only after the Paris Peace Conference. Britain is just, you know, is, is, uh, has, has still many, many uh, issues. We have the suffragette movement trying to push yeah, for, for, for real um, equal voting uh, uh, rights, and this will only finally be done in the 1920s. Uh, we could talk about the Irish problem, but we shouldn't, I guess. But but there are all kinds of, you know, there are they're, they're major problems. Um, the representation of African Americans in the political process is, of course, uh, is, is taken back by Wilson. Yeah, it's taken to the to the uh, sort of in, is, there's a retrograde development. He reintroduces segregation in the White House. So he is not a very perfect statesman of a perfect democratic republic. Nonetheless, you know, if you if you analyze the negotiations of 1919, what is very striking, I find, is that it's not the Congress of Vienna anymore, yeah, where you could have certain actors who, who only had to persuade maybe a, a king or yeah, very few people, apart from Castlereagh, who had to persuade the House of Commons. Yeah? Most of them could do supranational, supra yeah, kind of compromises, uh, as Paul Schroeder has shown in his, uh, one, in his masterpiece on the transformation of European politics. But by 1919, yeah, you have actors who, in the end, have to make Kind, uh, the kind of solutions or, or settlements that they can actually legitimize on the home front. That is, they have to gain yeah, 
um, a majority in, in the House of Commons, in the French Assembly, and as you know, in the US Congress, which becomes one of the, the biggest hurdles um, to the consolidation of this peace. And this affects all of them. Yeah? So the, the modern peacemaking is yeah, a kind of three-dimensional uh, sort of game where you have to find solutions to the actual issues as far as you can understand them. For example, the Polish-German border and the minority questions on that, you know, in that parameter. Then you have to think about your own domestic concerns and those of your interlocutors. You know? So for example, in, in terms of security, um, this, this I show in the chapter on security. So, Klemosov claims that if he doesn't get very tight guarantees, he will be kicked out of office and the French people will not go for it. Wilson says if he gives him classic uh, alliance guarantees, then the American people will never accept this and he will be out of office. Yeah? Lloyd George is trying to have it both ways. But he says, for example, that if, if the French go ahead with imposing so many strictures on Germany and require a lot of military presence on the Rhine for many decades to keep the peace, then he as a British prime minister will never convince uh, a population that has suffered through this war to become a military occupation, occupation power in Europe. Yeah? So they all use sometimes tactically, but very often genuinely felt domestic concerns. Then there is a third dimension. Yeah? This is the, that makes it even more interesting, but also complicated. Yeah? These countries and these domestic force fields, they are not in isolation from one another. Yeah? So you have debates, transnational debates about peace, about what to do with Germany, and they affect all of these domestic audiences. And they also have to be taken into account by these leading politicians which makes peacemaking, yeah, the, uh, think of nowadays European Council negotiations in Brussels, yeah, where you have all these leaders and they have to find between 20 odd sort of countries and, and Poland and Hungary, yeah, they have to find some kind of compromise and people use it. Think of Orban, how he uses his veto power and so on. Yeah, so this is, the, this is, what, this is what I call the, the, these are the, this is the nature, the changing nature of modern international politics. That's why the book's subtitle is The Transformation of International Politics. Yeah? So it's, um, it, it becomes much more demanding, but it also, 1919, sets the scene for the kind of international politics that we are more, you know, take for granted nowadays. And, and finally, it's not just an international politics, of course, between democratic leaders or states. Yeah? You have, eventually, you have to deal, so 1919, the question was, should they somehow... Uh, negotiate with the Bolsheviks. And Lord George was very much in favor of that. Uh, Clemenceau said, no, we are waiting for the other, the white forces to prevail. We don't want yeah, to, uh, to give recognition yeah, to, the, to the Bolsheviks. But they faced this question, which is so important nowadays. Yeah? What do you do if you're dealing with an interlocutor who simply doesn't accept your rules, your understandings of international law? Yeah? And, and, and this again, in 1919, the, the, the hope was to, in the end, make everyone more uh, yeah, Western, so to speak, and the League of Nations was supposed to embody that. But we can see from the 1920s onwards that in Europe, in Asia, and so on, uh, it's other forms, it's authoritarian or communist forms that also yeah, uh, are saying, no, uh, we don't accept these rules. Uh, yeah? And uh, so this is, again, a question that links up to our world, I would say. I think it does very much. And I think that, well, I could ask you probably a hundred more questions. And I know we could delve into the minutia of all of them because you are that well versed in, in, in every aspect of it. But I, I'll put one proposition to you. Maybe we need you in the European Council to shake up, you know, uh, some of these leaders to explain this is how it works. I mean, this week, you're right. We had Viktor Orban who refused to get on board with a, an oil embargo. Um, we need this knowledge. We need the understanding of how global politics works and international relations, how it's crafted. So absolutely. And, and this is, if I may say, um, I am very involved. I, I might eventually return to the United States. Now I'm based in Europe, but I am in a lot of uh, kind of networks and mechanisms where I do think that's very necessary to put into dialogue, yeah, leading scholars, also international relations, lawyers, but also historians who can give a bit of this kind of yeah, sort of perspective with policymakers who 
you know, at some point might be quite interested in this. Yeah, I think of Zelensky. He's a very interesting uh, sort of uh, policymaker in the, in the way in which he refers to history and how intelligently he's dealing with these questions. Um, but I and think I also that, say that Zelensky is a great publicist, which Clemenceau yes. and Lloyd George were, but Wilson wasn't. And that yeah. idea of being a good publicist, that goes back to your point about how the public and democracy is very much a part of our, our new world order. Absolutely. But Wilson, think of think about it. He actually was, he thought of himself as the best and prophetic publicist of them all, because what does he do in 1919? He doesn't go to Congress and tries to work out a, a compromise. He goes on a whistle stop tour using yeah, the, his, his power of rhetoric, uh, supposedly to force again from above to force the others to cave. And Think of how Obama sometimes was using, you know, grand speeches, and this is a very American phenomenon that uh, 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 Germans or Central Europeans would be much more cynical about, you know, the grand uh, oratory. We've had too many uh, dictatorial um, as aspirants uh, who try to use this, but I do think in the end, yeah, so this is why uh, when we go towards the, yeah, you asked me earlier, so when does the long 20th century end? I do think we are right now in this uh, transformative, cathartic phase where either because of the new crisis, we had COVID, we had the financial crisis before, now we have Russia's challenge. There's actually a kind of new, yeah, a regeneration, a revitalization of the kinds of ordering principles and practices yeah, that are required to build, to keep this Euro-Atlantic order, which in my view is also one of the key building blocks of any kind of functioning world order. Yeah? I do in this book, I hope that came through, I'm not a, a glorifier of this at all. I, I, I look at all the hier hierarchical assumptions that go into this, yeah? this kind of Euro-Atlantic idea that we are the, the most advanced civilizations and the rest of the world should follow. Nonetheless, if you think about a breakdown of yeah, NATO, of relations between the United States and the European Union, and then ask yourself in our world, who will pick up these pieces and how are we ever to get yeah, a kind of United Nations or other mechanisms that actually preserve peace, where you, yeah, and, and, and that take effective actions against yeah, brutal violators of international law of all the norms that we might, I hope, still hold dear. If you think of Putin and what he, what he, um, what his forces are doing in Ukraine, yeah. So I, I this is it comes back to this point about learning. Yeah. So I think in crisis sometimes, yeah, we they have this merciless effect of showing the corruptions, the complacencies, the the weaknesses. Yeah. And think of uh, Western relations with Putin up until yeah february think of german yeah sort of deals and so on american deals and trump and so on so it would be nice if yeah i could say so the leader should now read my book and immediately yeah, get fund uh, fundamentally different assumptions uh, or re re find again yeah the kinds of understandings they once had but i do think that we are in a period where i i would have not an optimism but at least i see a chance that we can get further along those lines than we could have got two years ago because yeah the the inertia the thing just muddling through yeah I think of Britain you know Johnson and uh, and the 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 idea that we basically should just sort of you know we we can't do anything in a very creative way anymore I do think this has to be questioned and that's exactly where you know I think scholars also can play a part. Yeah, so you have to find ways to get out of your ivory tower sort of, you know, self-referential way of talking about these things. And, and that's why I think even a, a format like a podcast can be at least a, an, an offer yeah, to, uh, to, to think about these kinds of questions. But in the end, um, I've, I've recently given a few talks in Washington. If you know the power structure of Washington and the kind of attention span that most people in that structure have, yeah, even a podcast or even a, a 10 minute uh, uh, discussion yeah, is, is beyond what a lot of people think is, is possible to, uh, to digest. And that's why you have this, you know, culture of sound bites of, uh, yeah, and then think of Twitter and think of all the ways in which thinking is made harder nowadays. That's where I think, you know, that, that's where you, you might, one might despair or you 
you have to take up your battle axe and say, no, we, I don't accept that. <laughs> well, I think our listeners are going to be delighted with the 90 minutes that we've spent talking about international order. And I know many of, many of the books that we've already reviewed on the show deal with this issue, none quite as exhaustively, but also the eloquence of your writing. And I think what listeners will get from our conversation today is that you know the topic inside and out, and you present a very compelling argument for, for, for why we need to think of the global order in this spatial, temporal, and geographical uh, uh, terms. So thank I can't thank you enough, Patrick, for, for coming on the show and spelling it all out. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I might add in a very selfless way that um, it is just about now when this podcast is aired that my book will actually come out in the United States. It's already out in the rest of the world, but um, this we are now in I think early July. And, um, and so I, of course, would um, encourage everyone to have a look at the thing itself. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> very I much, may. Patrick. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen, because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.